I always enjoy when they give me a microphone. So because we're the last presentation of the crowd, um, usually when we're the last presentation of anything, if you guys want to take this forward for, for whenever you do public speaking, I usually try to do a stunt, okay, to get people going, to get people interested, put their phones down, get people to turn around. If the only thing they remember about me is my stunt, okay, well, I solved something. They at least remembered my presentation for something. What did that guy talk about? Oh, he did a stunt. Okay, the stunt is, I heard there's people walking by, there's presentations next door. I want, whenever I speak in parallel uh, speaking opportunities, I usually try to have our room sound like the loudest room, regardless of how many people are in here. So the fact that you guys stuck around until the end is great. So what I'm going to ask everybody to do is either you can stand up and stomp your feet for the next 30 seconds, maybe, maybe, maybe 15 seconds is the younger crowd. Stand up and stomp your feet for the next 15 to 30 seconds, or drum roll on the table, and I'm going to go left to right, so these guys have to do it the longer period of time. I'm going to start with the people over there getting coffee, the people sitting there trying to avoid eye contact. You can start with stomping or, or standing up or drum rolling. Okay, keep on going. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I should have checked how this works, too, so this will look like it's more organized. So Jen and I decided to do this together, so it's going to feel a little bit of a stop at my part when she goes into her part on the Sustainable Technologies Evaluation Program. So I usually try to do a lot of public speaking engagement opportunities for young professionals, because I have one of the coolest jobs of the TRSA and a little bit more of the odder ones because I'm a corporate facing professional. So I'm part of a group that was named earlier by Bill, uh, Partners in Project Green, which is an initiative between the TRCA, the Pearson Airport, and these fine municipalities. It was started 10 years ago. There's a typo in my profile. I've actually been with the organization for five years, 12 years into the water industry. And our work is actually to help private sector businesses with sustainability initiatives on a conservation effort. So within my team, we work with these companies. So this is the membership from at the end of 2018. The good news is Seneca actually just joined last week. So if you want to access some of the information that we have, uh, go seek out uh, Professor Peter Forent, who's in the transportation and sustainability side of things, probably different people that you've never interacted with. Reach out to him. He's going to get random emails from you guys because you want access to this community. So this community represents a lot of the national, multinational stakeholders of the GTA. In our work in the five years since we started measuring and monitoring our impact, the one that I'm proud of, obviously and biased, is on water. So we've actually helped the community offset between 1.83 billion liters of water every year. So collectively, we've done five years worth of projects, a lot of them in the stormwater side, primarily in the process water and wastewater side. That's equivalent to about 780 Olympic-sized swimming pools. I recently saw what an Olympic-sized swimming pool looks like. It's actually quite massive. So for what it's worth, there's almost 800 of these that we've actually offset in the five years that we've been doing this type of work specifically. Um, it kind of off offsets the, the fact that we also have um, a lot of stakeholders who, who still use a lot of water. In the sustainability realm, our work is actually focused on energy performance, waste management, and communications and engagement to go beyond just water stewardship. We're actually adding a transportation department in the next couple of months or so. But to, to, to kind of align with the LID theme, um, what I inherited five years ago when I started was to actually get companies to do this type of work. So I apologize, I missed a few of the presentations earlier, had some deadlines this, uh, this morning. Uh, but the ones from this afternoon kind of hinted at the same things. How do you get companies or stakeholders to do this type of work? It's really expensive. It's really challenging. No one cares. These are all standard reasons. People in the LID engineering and technology space will all nod their heads and ex experience the same things. Well, I was brought in as a private sector specialist. I used to be a consultant in the US for water wastewater treatment technologies. So when I found this job at the TRCA, I was like, well, I'm applying what I can do to help convince companies to do something, just a different language. I'm not selling on anything anymore. I'm not a salesperson in this case. I don't have sales targets or challenges of that nature. I'm actually trying to convince them on different reasons outside of cost, outside of 
the, the typical reasons that they, they would normally want to do something, but try to find other reasons, okay? So the risk and the knowledge that we already know from the whole day is that for the last few years now, climate change is a big impact on, on a lot of this stuff. This is Mississauga, this is Toronto. Hopefully none of you were jumping out of cars or go trains back in 2013, but people do remember this. This is a good reference point. What we tried to do was create initiatives where we assisted the business community with business case development. So actually helping them with their concept development, helping them walk through and hold their hands in finding grants, helping them with their design in terms of finding technical experts. We wanted to find ways to make the projects go faster. So what I tried to do is I created and facilitated a vendor network of industry professionals and experts within the GTA that have done projects both public and private, to allow the vendors an opportunity to essentially skip the bid process. Not necessarily skip an RFP process, but skip the fact that, well, there's companies that can do this already that have GTA or Ontario-based examples as case studies, and this prevents the company from going through the slow, archaic process of Googling, or when I first started five years ago, I used to refer to people going and opening up the yellow pages. They can just look at this list, and there's 25 companies that can actually do this type of work. What has that resulted? Well, in the five years, we've done a number of water infrastructure projects and process water, wastewater, but I'm gonna focus on the ones that we've done on stormwater. So our first project, when I started five years ago, we actually helped the city of Brampton put in a bioswale uh, right by the county courthouse. So it's a small project, it's underground, you can't really see it. So there is a sign there, the, the sign is still there, a smaller version of it. But it's all underground. There's a cross-section of what was installed by the TRSA and the city of Brampton. We helped build this project with the uh, formerly MOECC. The one that I'm proud of was actually this public-private partnership. So when I came here five years ago, I was obsessed to trying to build public-private partnerships. I'm a chemist by trade. I'm not a business person. A lot of my business experience was learned by doing, working for a consulting firm on strategy. So the strategy was really applied to this project in Scarborough. So this is actually not that far from here. It's off of Finchdean Square. Uh, it's about 10 minute drive from here. You ever wanna see it? It's a really cool project. It's a, it's a company that does steel manufacturing of furniture, steel furniture, lab benches, and, and different types of installations of that type. They were celebrating their 30th anniversary. They wanted to celebrate with a small LID project. They wanted, they got a grant from um, Earth Day Canada to do a $5,000 install of a rainwater harvesting tank. And they decided, well, we're part of Partners in Project Green, what do they got? So the, the whole thing of celebrating the 30th anniversary, the, the company owner wanted to retire, kind of pass on the company to his kids, leave a legacy to his family. These are all the things I kind of grasp on. As a good, I guess, consultant or salesperson, I realized this is the reason they're gonna do something. Not necessarily the money, because they did get a grant from us. They, they got a grant from the province, but more so because they wanted to do something fun. And we, they wanted to leave something for his family. I almost envisioned a statue of the owner, Jim Ecclestone, in the middle of this property. This used to be uh, 44,000 square feet of the rooftop was, is being diverted, but this was 8,000 square feet of just grass in between two ICNI industrial, commercial, institutional buildings just a grass patch with benches at the front of the building where the people who smoke, smoke. This is all it's used for, just a grass infiltration, nothing else. $5,000 wasn't gonna buy anything. It was gonna buy the raspberry bushes that they were gonna have. They were gonna buy a used um, retention tank uh, for, for rainwater capture. So we suggested, why don't you do something bigger? You know, why don't, why don't you make a big impact with your 30th anniversary and really leave this behind for your family and for your company? And so we started working hand, hands-on with the company to, to try to convince them on designing something that they wanted to see. So they actually were ab about to acquire the building next door, which would double their staff size from 50 people to 110. They started to see that the smoking lounge area wasn't the big draw for this area and that this is unused space for both sides of the property. So now this could actually be used as a communal space to celebrate big things, have barbecues, have parties, do a whole bunch of stuff. The big thing that no one knew about was they had just closed Amazon, 
North America. So they went from being a small mom and pop company that was struggling to get by for 30 years of $6 million in revenue to now going up to $10 million in revenue. In the scale, in the grand scheme of things, not a lot of money, but for a company of that size, it's a big deal. So all of those factors, I knew that they had a reason to do something. We just caught them at the right time. Good luck and timing. We were very strategic about it. We worked hands-on with them. They came up with a design. They wanted to build these infiltration ponds, three of them, side by side, that take all the rainwater from the roof and let it spill over and infiltrate so nothing actually goes down the stormwater drain for no other reason but for infiltration. They got some in-kind from XCG Consulting and Grounds Covered, which is a landscape architect, local, family friend. They decided to do this. They did in the, I guess, completed in the summer of July of 2015. What Jim Ecclestone didn't tell us was that he wasn't retiring. He didn't tell his family any of this. He decided that they were going to bid on Amazon Europe, which was going to be a $25 million contract. And they were also going to bid on Target USA before Target left Canada. Target USA. And they were going to invite these stakeholders to our barbecue to kick off the launch and ribbon cutting of this project. They didn't tell any of us that Amazon and Target were coming, and so we didn't know that these people were going to be there, and they had already put in the submission for the bids, so it wasn't something that would necessarily positively influence the selection of their company, but they were already a vendor for Amazon for what it's worth. Fast forward to November of that same year, they won that contract. So they went from a $4 million business to a $10 million business to $35 million business. And as a result of that, as a thank you to TRCA, because they, did, they attributed them winning these, the second contract, the Amazon Europe contract, to our project, well, they gave us 75000 to do the next two. Sorry, 50000 to do the next two. So we's, we were working on, collaboratively with, with our watershed groups in Scarborough, to do a bunch of rain gardens with the Toronto District School Board. I had heard on the radio that there was a billion dollars of stormwater asset backlog just amongst uh, TDSB properties across the, uh, across the Toronto area, which I thought was terrible. That's a terrible number, $1 billion. That's actually what the headline was. And then I started to understand what the reasons were. And it's all related to master planning and the delays of, of implementation. So I said, what if we actually took some of this money to develop some pilots to speed things up? Same thing, speed things up again. But this one with a, an institutional sector rather than the private sector, because I kind of already learned all that. So we did the first pilot with, uh, with uh, Toronto Catholic District School Board. We just completed the last one, uh, second pilot, with, with Calstone's money. Uh, to do a rain garden on Tom Longboat. So this is, again, a five to 10 minute drive from here. It's an outdoor learning uh, circle and a rain garden pollinator habitat for a school that had to take two years to raise money to get a PA system. If you think how much money that is, it's $5,000. We came in with walking in to give them 63,000 on a public-private partnership side. Well, then that got me going. Okay, five years in now, PPPs are now the big thing for me. That's, that's all I think about. I commute to and from Guelph, so I spend three hours a day just thinking about PPPs, if you think about that commute time. A lot of traffic, a lot of dead time, so I think about how to solve problems. So the first one is actually similar to Shannon's, uh, Shannon's initiative that she was talking about from CVC, the grid project. We're doing something similar with CVC and the Mississauga Board of Trade and the city of Mississauga. Uh, we've got some pre-approved funding from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to influence the ICNI sector on commercial, uh, commercial property ownership, to have them position themselves as industry leaders, even though they're multinationals and everybody knows them as very big flagship industry leaders, to have them to start to demonstrate stormwater management in Mississauga, to encourage that uptake of that stormwater credit that was talked about earlier in Mississauga, and to see if we can replicate that. Where this idea came from is some random drive home where I had read something that said smart centers builds 300 box store plazas in North America every year. So if you think of those Walmart plazas, they have 300 of those popping up every year, and the standard build for those is a stormwater pond. You know, and basic flatscape technology, 
and just an old school hard surface. Beautification along the sides, the green sides, and just big buildings and big parking lots. So I said, what if we can challenge them on a competitive basis, keeping up with the Joneses? If we had smart centers or Bentall or one of these big companies raise their hand and say, hey, I want to do that. And the next thing you know, your next door neighbor puts in the same windows that you put in or something similar. Well, it's the same concept here, just with big multinational budgets rather than your next door neighbor competing with you on, on the type of car you just bought or the type of house that you put, uh, the type of door you put in. So the same kind of concept in terms of replication. We're going to have them all compete against each other to help influence the industry to see if we can get some positive growth for implementation. The school program is still going, so we want to do about five more of these, five to ten, conservatively. We had originally positioned to the province to do 75, and I, I looked at that as I, I was probably going to be doing this for the, the rest of my life if I wanted to do 75. So five to ten seems like a more realistic uh, kind of growth plan for replication of those school pilots. Um, our ICNI sector approach um, is actually looking to expand in, in the Durham region. So we're actually looking to do this in Duffins Carruthers Park, uh, uh, sorry, Duffins Carruthers Watershed, uh, to do three to five more pilot projects with a lot of the manufacturers out here. The big one being um, Ontario Power Generation. That's our big target for this area. Okay, I will pass it over to Jenny. Thank you very much, Eric. Hi, thank you. And. Uh, I'm really delighted to be uh, the last speaker of the day today because as I was preparing the slides that I wanted to talk about, I realized that I could bring projects and talk to you about different projects as we've seen so many of today. I work in a team with so many talented designers and inspection technicians and uh, project managers and I'm, I'm lucky to be involved in many projects in a little way. But I thought, no, let's, I'll take this opportunity to just sort of wrap up a little bit and give you guys like a little bit of a chance to sort of summarize and think a little bit about what we've heard today. So we've heard this step a number of times and I joined the Sustainable Technologies Evaluation Program a couple of years ago now. And uh, we, we saw the logos, it encompasses Toronto and region. We can see that there down by the lake. The credit, and Toronto Region has around about 600 employees in the winter time. So it's quite a big organization. I don't see Eric terrifically often, although we share an office. I sort of wave at him like from the far side of the building. Credit Valley Conservation, with whom we partner, is about half the size as an organization. And I asked uh, Shannon earlier about a couple of people that we both knew the names of, and she was like, oh yeah, of course I know so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so around the office, because they're about half the size of our organization, so people know one another. The third partner is the Lake Simcoe region. So you can see that they cover a much bigger geographical region, but as, as an organization, they're about half the size again. So they're a really small office, and lots of people are fulfilling lots of different roles. So people with similar job titles at Lake Simcoe will be doing quite different work perhaps than somebody in Toronto and region. Because in Toronto and region with a bigger organization, you tend to end up being involved in a narrower field of work because you've got a colleague who's covering other areas of similar specialization. Now, step. We sort of sliced it a little bit technically earlier about the kinds of things that STEP are involved in, but this is the sort of, um, this is the corporate message. This is what we're about. We're about trying to improve implementation. And again, this is something you've heard about again and again and again today. And we go about this by addressing barriers, which is very much something we've heard about today. We undertake technology evaluations. So that's just another way of saying that we undertake long-term monitoring and then write projects like that, just the same as you would do a research project in school. We uh, produce design guidance because otherwise all of this good knowledge is just like, it's not going anywhere. It's not helping to affect change. So we have to take our technical reports and we have to do the outreach that Eric was just speaking about, like going out to professionals who are uh, in the corporate world and in the consulting world and help sort of convey the message about uh, how technologies are changing, because they change really quickly. And that brings me to the final point, which is about education, outreach, and training. And that's where my own role is as a research scientist in the team. Ooh. So, um, 
the reason that I'm here today, and not my colleague Lisa, who's an erosion control specialist, is because my work focuses very much on the low impact development part of the focus areas within STEP. So I have people who sit right next to me who focus on stream restoration and open channel hydraulics. Have any of you guys done open channel hydraulics? A little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Uh, have any of you uh, done any erosion and sedimentation control work? Right. I didn't know anything at all about that until I got involved with the International Erosion Control Association. They have a great website and they are very generous with students if you want to attend their conferences or get involved in their meetings. That's how you can learn about erosion sediment control. But as I said, my work now is in LID. So now we can have a like pop quiz. What kind of technology do we have in the top left? Permeable pavement. Uh, what do you suppose is happening in middle top there? That's a very large rainwater harvesting system going in there. So that's just a great big underground tank. So that is in no way putting the water into the soil. That water is just being captured for later reuse on a large uh, commercial campus. Can you make out what's happening in the top right photograph there? Yep, yep, that one's a green roof. Uh, and bottom left, what would you call that? It is going underneath a pavement, yeah. Uh, that's actually, we would call those infiltration chambers or infiltration galleries, and they're a very popular solution for firstly storing a lot of water, but then also permitting it to drain out through the aggregate underneath. And they can go underneath playing fields, uh, they can go underneath parking lots, and they're often sort of a hidden piece of infrastructure. And then on the bottom right there, those are silver cells, those are tree cells. So that's a form of bioretention that is specifically designed with a plastic scaffolding underground that's helping to support the pavement. And that allows the trees in the middle of the median to get really big, whilst also capturing the storm water. And all of these we call source controls because that means that it's treating the water exactly where it lands. And that's what a lot of what we've heard about today uh, is involving those kinds of technologies. We have also done research on conveyance. So that's just getting water from one place to another. And this is a very different set of photographs because these kinds of infrastructure are often hidden. The linear uh, diagram on the top left is um, I'm trying to make out what is called a third pipe system or a exfiltration trench or um, a perforated pipe system. And the idea is, I don't know if you can make out that the lower pipe has uh, perforations. Can you see that that's a dashed line? And so the idea is that the normal street sewer has a second sewer underneath that will allow the water to escape. So we've still got the conventional gray infrastructure. There's very low risk for the municipality but we are getting that sort of water balance benefit. We're getting extra water actually percolating down into the ground. And if you open up one of those manholes where those blue arrows indicate gorgeous fresh stormwater falling in, what you see is what we see there on the uh, lower right. And there's actually a pair of pipes. So there's a pair of pipes coming in, a pair of pipes going out, and somewhere further up the manhole is where we have the standard minor system sewer, which is the upper pipe on there. They're really hard to explain. I've, I've, watched, I've watched some very talented friends and colleagues also screw this one up. It's difficult to convey how that works, but it's also a form of low impact development and something that's increasingly popular with different municipalities around here. Finally, we also do work on end of pipe facilities and Eric was just talking about stormwater ponds and how they are very conventional and not the very best management practice available these days. But there's still a lot of research to be done on to how do we cope with that infrastructure that we already have? How do we maintain it effectively? How do we enhance it? How do we um, repair it? How do we like add functionality to it? and also uh, wetlands, which are a similar sort of end of pipe facility. So we do work around those as well. And these few slides show uh, my colleagues undertaking their various activities. So I've got uh, colleagues who work in the energy 
side of things. So it's not all just water-based. Uh, they have um, a house that is essentially a laboratory and lots of installations. And this is their full-time job. They've come out of uh, school and then they've gone into a job where they just do experiments all day and then write reports on energy. Similarly, here are some of our colleagues uh, from CVC and from TRCA. They're undertaking field research on the performance of permeable pavement. We can see some people that are testing the surface there. And we can also see somebody who's testing the water levels inside the system. So he's sat next to a monitoring well, and he's got a, like a depth sensor that he can drop in and see how much water is underneath that pavement. These are jobs that typically take place like nine months of the year. It is not always this sunny. But uh, they're people who get lots of fresh air and exercise for sure. I'm very envious of these positions. And then uh, alongside these types of uh, experiments, we also have, we work with arborists and landscape architects that do another kind of monitoring. They check on how the plants are doing inside the bioretention. Plants are very susceptible to salt. And where do we find salt? We have salt on the roads. So if we connect the roads to the bioretention, we've now got like some sort of conflict of interest. There's a lot of active research in that area at the moment. And I also have colleagues that are very interested in the biochemistry and the way that things work inside soil. So we have these massive soil test plots where we're looking at how soil can be made to perform much better, even when it's just under turf grass, just being normal. Now, this is the reason that I brought the notes up here with me, because throughout the day, I've been writing down some of the kinds of positions and things that are related to LID, and I've come up with a list of job titles and things that perhaps you hadn't heard of or thought about before today that are all related to do with LID. I've got inspection and monitoring technician, drainage superintendent, design engineer, construction manager, project manager, community champion, regulator, permitting and enforcement, design review, hydrologic modeler, researcher, policy writer, product developer, and distributor. So in the field of engineering, you might think that uh, a lot of the jobs that are out there are going to involve some sort of office work full time. There's a lot of work in LID that involves uh, construction management and having to go and see that things are being built correctly. Uh, this slide in particular was to remind me to talk about my particular role. So I do um, education for professionals. Uh, last year, I think I had around 400 to 500 uh, professional students. These are people who are often older than myself, have been in the engineering industry for a very long time and have a huge amount of experience in designing stormwater management. And the role that STEP take is to try to like help people refresh their knowledge. So they've been working for a long time with techniques and technologies that they're familiar with, but everybody could use a refresher, right? Because technology keeps moving forwards. So we do professional development. We also do a design review, which is why I've just got this um, illustrative diagram of a construction drawing. On this particular drawing, we've got all the flow paths with these black arrows. And my role here was to do some blue sky thinking with them to actually say, well, you've got a paving area in the middle between your two buildings. What's the potential for you to use permeable pavement? Is there a parking lot directly underneath? Or would that be possible? What is the potential for you guys to use rainwater harvesting? So I don't get involved in permitting. I don't tell them if they can or can't do something. We have colleagues at Toronto Region Conservation Authority. And in fact, at all conservation authorities and all municipalities where that's their full-time job is they look at consultants' drawings and they say, yes, you can do that. Yes, we've checked your math, we think that works. But instead, happily, I get involved in like, yes, but what if kind of work. Um, I also produce uh, work in documentation. This is um, the LID Stormwater Management Planning and Design Guide. Um, it's at a very slightly different URL than you've been given several times already today. You've been told about sustainabletechnologies.ca. 
This is wiki.sustainabletechnologies.ca, but you can link, you can get backwards and forwards between them, no problem. One of the things that you can find on the wiki is the low impact development treatment train tool, which I'm not sure if anybody of you here would have heard of that before. Have you heard of this before? Yeah, right, I'm checking, this is the wrap up. <laughs> Good, so one, one person was listening apparently, Christopher, good job. <laughs> uh, so yes, this is part of the whole suite of different activities that we do. So Shannon's already talked about some of the work from uh, STEP, we've already heard about the treatment train tool, and this is a resource that you can come into the website and you can find detailed design advice. So if you're working on projects now, or if you're working on design projects in the future, this is a free resource, it's for you. So please go, drop by and use it. And that, that is that. And uh, I would be delighted to take any questions from anyone.